I've been accused by people at times of buying a piece of sports equipment, a fitness gadget, only because it looked cool or even just sounded cool, with no regard for its cost, its likelihood of being effective, or even just plain old common sense. Two words for those people, monkey feet. Good morning, welcome to the garage where it is currently about minus a billion in here. I have been using my monkey feet, although I only have one, so foot, monkey foot, whatever, for about two weeks now. Not long enough to establish whether there are any significant fitness gains to be had from this, but definitely long enough to establish that there is a lot about it that I like. I didn't do a whole sort of unboxing video when I got this, simply because I was somewhat skeptical. I had visions of it being cumbersome to use, impractical, badly made. Turns out I need not have worried. So what does it do and why might it help me cycling and running? Very simply, it clamps onto a dumbbell. I've also tested it, it'll work just fine on a kettlebell. Basically anything with a handle wide enough that it's got space to grip onto. So a really tiny dumbbell might be too narrow. You then attach it to your foot and boom, you now have a weight at the end of your leg. From there, you could exercise in a way that is not dissimilar to how you'd exercise your arms by holding a weight at the end of them. At this point, a common question that I've been asked by people seeing me using this in the gym is could you not just attach a rubber band to your foot or attach your foot at the ankle to a low pulley machine? You could. The problem with rubber bands is that, especially if you're moving through a large range of motion, the degree of resistance that the band applies will obviously change during the exercise as the band stretches. And the problem with low pulley machines, ignoring the fact that the one at my gym is always busy, is that the pulley is never at actual floor level, meaning if you're doing an exercise where you want to be starting with your leg straight down at full extension, close to the floor, you're already too high. You could stand on a box, but I'm six foot six on a box, I'm gonna look ridiculous. And also, no one's telling people doing bicep curls, why don't you go over and use the pulley machine instead? Which of course you could do, but most just want to use a free weight at the end of their limb. It feels very natural to lift something that way, and this is not that different. Somebody also said that they did similar exercises just by hooking their toes through a kettlebell handle. The issue with that is if you lift something that way, you need to contract the anterior tibialis running down the front of your shin to keep your toes up. And they will probably get tired a long time before the muscle you're actually trying to work. This requires zero effort to keep it on your foot because it is literally clamped there with the strength of a monkey. Bang. Now, before I get onto how it works and what you can do with it, let me explain why I got it, aside from it being called a monkey foot. You may recall, I ran a 100K ultramarathon this year, longest distance I've ever done, and one of the only pains I suffered in training for that event and during it was hip flexor pain. At the time, I put it down to problems caused by very heavy deadlifting in the weeks before the race. Your hip flexors attach around the pelvis and the lumbar spine, so the issues with the back can present themselves in the hips and the hip flexors at the front, even though the source of that pain might be elsewhere. Anyway, that was an annoying thing to happen, and towards the end of the race, I had multiple occasions where I was stubbing my feet or tripping over things. I actually fell over a three inch curb at one point. I thought it might just be general fatigue, but looking back, I wondered if it was more specifically fatigue or weakness in my hip flexors, which was simply not lifting my knees up high enough for my foot to clear the ground each step. Then not long after that run, I rode in a duathlon without clipping myself into the pedals on the bike because it was a very short race and I wanted a super fast changeover. One of the negatives of not being clipped in is that I wasn't able to pull up with my foot as I rode, only pushed down. A lot of people said, doesn't matter, makes no difference anyway. So I did a video in here on the bike, clipped in versus not clipped into the pedals. And while there wasn't a significant difference in power or speed overall, something that I definitely noticed was that the inability to pull up with my foot while pedaling prevented me from switching to that style of riding during a race in order to give my quads, hamstring, glutes a breather. It was something I hadn't really given much thought to before, but being unable to do it, I suddenly realized how useful it was. In subsequent rides, clipped in, I then noticed that I was only able to do it for a short duration at moderate wattage, and that was fine for taking that sort of short breather in a race, but it did occur to me if I was able to do it for longer and more powerfully, wouldn't that be handy? So I found myself again thinking about hip flexors, and it occurred to me there are really two problems with them. First of all, is that many people spend a long time like this, sat down all day, which shortens the hip flexors. It leaves them tight, that causes them to work inefficiently and be weak. If you spend eight hours a day, five days a week with your arm like this in a sling, you'd expect your bicep to shorten and weaken. And because one of the muscles that makes up your hip flexors is your psoas major, which is the only muscle in the body that directly connects your lumbar spine to your leg, that often results in bad backs. And the second problem is that it's not a muscle that gets worked much, if at all, in comparison to other lower body muscles anyway. 
I've noticed this year with all the cycling I've started doing, my quads have got much stronger. And then the deadlifting I did the early part of this year meant my glutes, my hamstrings again got much stronger. And all the running I do, especially using a midfoot strike, means my calves have always been relatively strong, at least since I started running. Until about the age of 35, they were appalling. One of the reasons I wear shorts all the time, even when it's freezing, is that while I do not have amazing calves by any stretch of the imagination, they are not the non-existent things they were for the bulk of my adult life. I'm making up now for lost leg exposure. But those muscles got strong primarily through extension of the hip or the knee or the ankle, coming up from a squat for quads, coming up from a deadlift for glutes and hamstrings and pushing off the ground when running for calves. But bringing the knee up towards the body and flexing at the hip, reducing that angle here, it's just not something that gets trained very much, not under weight anyway. That angle reduction nearly always happens as the negative phase of an exercise. So going down in a squat where the work has been done elsewhere. So as a result, not only is this area untrained, it's also massively imbalanced compared to the other muscles around it. All that led me to knees over toes guy, pretty much the go-to YouTube expert for lower body stretching, strengthening, injury prevention. He has a ton of stuff on things you can do to basically make yourself more explosive, less likely to encounter problems, just all around fitter below the waist. Joe Rogan also loves him. Whether that's a for or against, I guess, depends on what you think of Joe Rogan. I like the guy, to be fair to him. He probably knows a few things about hip flexor strength, given he's about four foot six, but if he kicked you in the head, he would take it clean off. So watching his videos, knees over toes guys, not Joe Rogan's, I got on top of stretching and flexibility for my hips. I've got a sit stand desk in my office, so I'm not sat down for anywhere near as long as I used to be, and every morning I'll do a short stretching routine to hopefully correct years of shortening those muscles. And moving on to strengthening those muscles, knees over toes guy, and Joe Rogan have the monkey foot. So in the UK, these are 75 pound, although currently sold out on the only place that seems to sell them in the UK. And although 75 pounds sounds a lot, it is a well-made piece of kit. There's quite a lot of moving parts here. You don't want them failing, and it all feels pretty substantial. It locks onto whatever you're attaching it to really solidly. The ratchet strap system works perfectly every time, as does the quick release. Is it worth 75 pound? It's not far off. In terms of what you can do with them, lots of stuff. You've basically got a weight on the end of your foot. Possibilities are extensive. And there's loads of websites out there showing you different options. The three ones that crop up most commonly are knee extensions. I don't like knee extensions. It's very unusual for your knee joint to move extension-wise in isolation of your hip. I just think there are better ways for you to train your quads. Use for knee injuries, I understand. But for general fitness, I don't like it. So I don't need to replicate it in another way with this. Hamstring curls. This one makes sense, but as I said, my hamstrings get plenty of exercise. For example, in the gym today, when I did a monkey foot workout, I started off with some deadlifting, then did some deep dumbbell deadlifts, then some Nordic curls. I don't need more hamstring work. And the most common exercise, and the knees over toes guy does these all the time, is hip flexion. And that's what I do with them. It's what I got them for. So as I said, today's workout was deadlifts, first of all. I've actually got up to a couple of hundred kilos on deadlifts, but I find recovering for that sort of weight takes me a while. If I push it too hard, I get backache. So now I tend to stick around 140 and take the reps right up. I've got the High Rocks event coming up in a month's time, so I need to be not just strong, but also have a good amount of muscular endurance. So lots of reps, lots of sets at the moment. Then dumbbell deadlifts, and then these Nordic curls, which I've been doing for a pretty short time now, hoping to see some real development in these next year, my ability to do them fully. I'm slightly disadvantaged by having a long, heavy upper body, so there is a sort of leverage issue working against me. But even so, I'd like to get to a point where I can at least control the descent for much longer and obviously be more explosive on the way back up. Knees over toes guy makes it look very easy. And then onto the hip flexors. Standing on a small step so I get full extension of the leg, trying to maintain an upright body position, and then four sets of 12 reps each leg. As you can see, super simple to do and super simple to swap the device from one foot to the other. Funny enough, last week somebody saw me doing them and said it looked like a hassle to be putting this off and on. He was on the squat right next to me, taking ages to load and unload his plates. In reality, getting set up on this is fast and easy compared to a lot of other exercises. And as I said, while it is too early really to identify any physical improvement from those, I can say it's enjoyable to use them. It works as described. It's a nice movement in the sense it's very easy to do and feel it working. There's almost a sort of bicep curl feel to bringing the knee up. It actually feels quite a powerful thing to be doing. I guess if you do any sort of kicking based martial arts, you'd understand that. Most of us rarely do anything that actually uses that movement with any force. There's no discomfort during it, during the exercise or afterwards, you just get routine muscle fatigue that I'd expect anyway. No discomfort or feeling pulled or strained afterwards, just a delayed onset muscle soreness that came in 
a couple of days after I first used them. In fact, interestingly, the only hip flex of discomfort I've had recently was when I did a fast row last week, pulling myself back into the machine on recovery too fast, slightly strained my hip flexors, which are not used to doing that sort of explosive movement. It wasn't a bad pain, but it wasn't routine muscle soreness. This area here definitely felt like it had been given too much to do. So what is my hope? That stronger hip flexors translates to greater endurance, so that they don't start to ache when I run, keeping me able to lift my feet off the ground each step, greater strength, so I can use them to more effect on the bike, on the upstroke of cycling, allowing me to adopt that style for longer and with more power. And then those two things combined with the flexibility side, greater injury prevention, which may well allow my deadlifts to creep back up without discomfort, we'll have to see. Interestingly, while it might not have increased strength at this early stage, it has given me a better sense of awareness of that movement and that muscle area. I was doing a ride on the bike a couple of days ago with Nixon, a little warm up for our Christmas Eve ride up out to Zwift and I was super aware of using my hip flexors to pull up and over on the pedal movement in a way that I hadn't really been before. I'd always pulled up before, I just hadn't done it with any real feeling of strength or power in that movement. This time in my head, I could easily relate the movement from the gym to what I was doing on the bike. So there'll be more updates to come. I'm not sure entirely how to measure improvement, if any occurs. No discomfort after heavy deadlifting would be an obvious one, but it's not really where I'm most interested in getting an improvement. I think fatigue after long endurance runs it might be something that is an obvious sign that I've gotten stronger in that area. Ultimately, the best case scenario would be that I find that when I'm cycling in a race in here, that adding some emphasis to the upstroke while still pushing down, so basically applying power through the entire revolution, sees my wattage jump up. Again, we'll have to see. Okay, before I wrap this up, after that I did that leg workout, I jumped on the row machine, did a thousand meter row, which is the length of row that I need to do during the high rocks event. My legs were pretty wasted after all that lifting, so slightly comparable, I guess, to the state I might find myself in when I get to the rowing machine during the race. If you watch my last rowing video, you'll know that this thousand meter row that I just did is basically the second time I've used the rowing machine in 30 odd years. I tried to go at a pace that was quick, but not excessively so. I appreciate that despite my little experience, my size allows me to be an okay rower. So I'm trying to use this in the race as an opportunity to rest while still going hopefully quicker than many. Anyway, three minutes, 16 for a thousand meters and felt pretty good afterwards. Uh, just in case you're interested in how that high rocks training is going. Uh, is that a good time? I don't know really. If you row, tell me. As always, any questions, stick them in the comments. Please like and subscribe as well. We're currently charging towards 30,000 subscribers, which is a bit cool. Next video, all being well, dropping on Christmas Day, me and Nixon up out to Zwift. Objective A, get up out to Zwift. Objective B, beat our last time, which is currently the man dog out to Zwift world record, because no one else has ever done it. And objective C, which could be a bit out of reach, I think, is get under the hour. But you never know. If I play Rocky IV loud enough, anything could happen. Man, it is so cold in here.